because I just caught fire. Welcome to the Swedish Maker. Today I'm making this $8,000 oak slab table. So my brother found an oak table for $8,000 and he said, Can you make it? And I said yes without thinking it through. And I started by trying to find wood, because that's a good starting point. And I have this angle iron, so I'm just going to use that to make my sled. Alright, so lesson to my future self. I should not be wearing a flannel shirt when using the angle grinder because I just caught fire. So I did one of the sides and this, it's a total mess in here, it's so much dust, but I'm going to clean some of it up and then I'm going to flip this one over and do the other side as well before I get to, to the second slab. <laughs> Once the slabs were plain down, I could go ahead and cut them to size. For this I used my circular saw with a guide track and I was really careful to get the cut lines as straight as possible. Now this might be a good time to take a look at what type of table this is going to be. So the table consists of two slabs with a tiny gap in the middle. The legs are made from metal and a friend of mine, Simon from Nordhem Design, helped me build them and you should go check out his Instagram because he makes these kinds of tables all the time. To keep the table flat, I'm inserting C-channels 
It will add some strength to the table as well as prevent it from bending and warping over time. I sanded off the epoxy from the top of the table and then I installed the C-channels. I marked out the lines and then I used the router to cut the slots for the channels. And then I sanded everything to 120 grit sandpaper and then I could go ahead and apply the finish, which in this case is Rubio Monocoat Cotton White. When the finish was dry, I could go ahead and add some insert nuts into the table to attach it to the legs. I added my logo on the end of the table and it's done. Most watch boxes have some kind of pillow or something else that you wrap the watch around. And the problem with that is that I'm just too lazy to use it. So I want to make something that's quick and easy to use. So let's start prototyping. So I have just made this cardboard box just to try to get the measurements right. I want to make this a four watch storage box. That's the amount of watches I normally go through using. I think the size of this is pretty good. So I'll just head to the computer to draw it up. So I think I might have a solution here. Uh, well, it means I have to 3D print the bottom part because it's going to be too hard to make it out of wood. At first I thought about doing a solution where you attach the watch to this piece and you just lower it into the box and it'll probably stay in place, but not that good. And also it doesn't remove the issue of having to take the watch off and strap it around something else. So this goes to the bin. What I've made now instead is a box with four compartments and like a bridge between the compartments, which means you should potentially just hang the watch on top of there. So I'll just go ahead and print it and we can take it from there. So I really wanted to print this bridge without supports because it would be a nightmare removing the supports. So I made small pillars with a 45 degree base because the 3D printer can print at 45 degrees without supports. The only problem now is that those pillars are kind of getting in the way of the strap. 
So I need to remove the pillars and have the 45 degree base attached to the compartment sides instead. Also, the watch doesn't stay in place on top of the bridge, so I need to figure that out. So one idea would be adding a magnet to the bridge, I guess. So I'll do some redesigning so that we can print a new version. And I guess when it is printing, I can go ahead and start making the lid. So the way I imagine the lid opening is that it's like swivels around and that's why I inserted this brass rod on the bottom. And I also added a couple of small magnets so that when the lid rotates around it kind of stays open or closed, in theory at least. And the only issue with this is that the rod needs to be in the exact position, otherwise it won't be a perfect match when it's closed. So I used a 3D printer and I made a jig for drilling the holes that you saw me using. And on top I made a watch that I drew up in Illustrator and then I carved it with the X-Carve and then I just filled it with some copper epoxy. I'm not totally pleased with epoxy, it doesn't really have that shine that I wanted, but it's good enough. And I have my 3D printed box, so let's just go ahead and add some magnets and put it together.
So there we have it. There are some issues with it still. One of them is that it's perfect to use with digital watches since I have the magnets down here, but not with regular watches because magnets and regular watches don't go good together because it will affect the timekeeping and that's a pretty important function of the, the watch. You can still use regular watches, of course, but you should probably turn them off before putting them down. The swiveling function works really good. The magnets keep it in place if it's open or closed, uh, which is really good. And I think it looks nice, but the copper inlay, I wasn't too pleased with. And I'm also considering making it just a tad bigger. So I think I might, you know what? Hang on. Now, that's more like it. I don't think I'm totally done with this project. I mean, storing watches seems to be pretty hard. The use of magnets is great. I mean, it works perfectly with the digital watches, of course. I don't know, maybe pillows are even better. But it just takes too much time, doesn't it? Anyway, I really enjoy the look of it. The way the plastic contrasts the lid and also how the epoxy looks now with the gold instead of the copper. Now if you want to make one of these, I'll upload the files to Thingiverse so that you can download them yourself. And if you have any suggestions on how to make it even better, let me know in the comments down below. Now if you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. I don't know, maybe pillow... I don't know, maybe pillars, pillars. I decided to 3D print the bottom of the part. I think I have something, something else that you just, most watch boxes have some kind of. Today I'm turning this IKEA kitchen cabinet into this. So this is actually a wall cabinet for the kitchen from Ikea. We just renovated my daughter's room and she wanted a dresser and we had this. So I figured why not make a dresser for her. This one is called Metude and it's around 30 bucks. So the basic idea is to cover up the sides and the top with some MDF and that will also frame the drawers that I'm going to put in. And of course, I'm just going to use Ikea's drawers since they're made to fit the cabinet. But on the drawer front, I'll be using the x carved to create a harlequin pattern. Let's start by cutting up some MDF.
So because I'm a complete idiot, I rounded over all the edges of the MDF. And that's going to create a weird gap between the top piece and the side piece. But success is a poor teacher, right? So now it's just onto the drawers. So right now the drawer fronts are just plain and pretty boring. So I'm going to use the X-Carve to add the pattern to the drawers. IKEA have all their sizes posted online, so I just drew up a square equal to this drawer front in Fusion 360 and I created a Harlequin pattern. Then I could export that pattern as an SVG file and import it into Invendables Easel. Now these drawer fronts are almost 800 millimeters long and that means that it's a bit too big for the X-Carve, which means I have to do some tiling, which I've never done before, so I don't know how this will go. The tiling function simply gives you the measurements for where the tiles are going to start and end. So I'll just mark up both the start and the end for both the tiles. Once the first tile is carved, I can move my workpiece and align the second mark with my starting position and it should work perfectly. Theoretically, I, like I've said, I've never done this before. actually looks good. I did screw up a little in the middle between the tiles, but that's on me for being an idiot. But for the next one, uh, I think I can make it better. Now, all that I have to do is just repeat the process three more times and the drawers will be done. Now I'm going to paint everything and I'm going to use a paint sprayer. And that might seem like an expensive option, but it actually isn't. The paint sprayer is about $50. And all you need, except for the paint sprayer, is a compressor and some skills, which I don't have. But the more I use it, the better results I'm getting. Before I paint, I like to make sure that everything is properly cleaned. And since the drawer fronts already had a coat of paint, I gave them a light sand down just to make sure the primer will stick. And I'm going to start with this primer from Zinzer uh, that is shellac based. So there are different primers and this one is perfect to use on laminated surfaces such as the drawer fronts from IKEA. And since it's good for the laminated surfaces, it's going to work great with the MDF as well. And then I can go ahead and paint the drawer fronts and all of the MDF panels. Alright, so it's time to attach the legs, but unfortunately, since this is a wall cabinet, it doesn't have threaded inserts. So what I'm going to do instead is just drill a hole, put this through the hole and add a knot on the inside of the cabinet. Alright, so the next step is just putting everything together and that should be pretty easy. But I'm going to start with the sides and the top piece. And I have the cabinet lying down here, so I'm just going to put the side pieces and align it like this. I'll add some double-sided tape on the inside, put it there and I can add some screws from the inside of the cabinet to hold it in place. So one thing we didn't do was we didn't paint the, the inside of the MDF. And unfortunately, that's going to be visible when the drawers are opened. 
but we don't have any more time to to do that so we'll just keep it like this for now and we can come back and paint the inside later on So now that this is done, it's all about adding the, the drawers and I'm going to add some pulls to the drawer fronts, of course, and then we can just install everything. All right, so there we have it. I think it turned out really good. I'm really proud and my daughter is really happy about it. Yeah, we have to go back and paint the insides of VMDF pieces, but we'll do that later since it's not a problem. But yeah, it's great storage and what a fun project to do from an IKEA cabinet. So let's try this out. <laughs> So I got this weird commission from someone named John Snow. The Swedish maker. You are the man. I need you to build me a chair made from birch plywood. I want it to be beautiful and strong and stylish. I'll pay you three dragons. I need it done in two days. Cheers. I guess I can do that. I've always wanted to make a chair and now that I have the X-Carve, it's a great opportunity to try it out and make a chair. So I drew up a chair in Fusion 360. The chair is designed for 18 millimeter plywood and it consists of 16 different pieces. And that's going to take a while to cut out. Are you like me standing around your CNC watching so that it doesn't blow up when it's running? It's also quite paralyzing and I get stuck looking at it, but it isn't very effective. And today I'm going to change that, but more on that later. So this took me around six hours to cut out and I think I might have been able to go even faster. But this was only the prototype. As you can see it's made out of MDF and I have a lot of things I want to change with it. And that's also the reason I made it in MDF because MDF is so much cheaper than birch plywood. So I didn't even fully finish the prototype because I could already see the mistakes I'd made. 
Well, it seems to hold up, but the shape is a bit off and there are some other things I need to change. So back to the computer uh, for a second version. Okay, so I've redesigned the chair and I managed to get the size down to be exactly half a sheet of plywood, which is perfectly good because you could make two chairs from one sheet of plywood. That's very basic maths that I know you can do yourself, so I don't know why I said that. So one of the changes I did was that I decreased the depth of the seat because it was too deep. And I also scrapped the double layered seat. And instead I'm going to have the seat go all the way out to the edge. That way there's not going to be a buildup of dust in the gap between the seat and the legs. And I also changed the angle of the back leg a bit. And I also raised the seat rest a bit to better fit the back. So here's how I'm going to speed the next chair up. I'm not going to cut all the way through the plywood for a couple of reasons. I don't want to leave a lot of marks on my wasteboard and by not cutting all the way through I'm saving that. I can then use a flush trim bit to remove the last piece of material and that way I'm also saving time because I can do this when the CNC is still working with the next piece. That also means I don't have to worry about removing any imperfections from the tabs. So with all of the changes done I can go ahead and start working with plywood. I also had a bunch of holes cut on the CNC for aligning the pieces when I'm gluing them together. And the holes are 8 millimeters, which is the same size dowel I'm using. So let's just glue everything together. Now there's one piece that I didn't cut on the CNC and that is the support piece for the back of the chair. And the reason I didn't cut that on the CNC is because it has an angle that would be a lot harder to cut on the CNC and a lot easier to do on the table saw.
legs are glued together, but to be able to drill the holes for the dowels on the stretchers, I actually went ahead and made some 3D printed jigs for that. And these are going to help me align it. So there's one piece that goes onto the leg piece and then another piece that goes onto the stretcher. The project is uploaded to Inventables projects and you can use the exact same files as I did. But if you want to modify it, I have also uploaded a bundle to my website with all the files necessary to make changes. Consider this an open source project where you can modify and do changes all you want. And if you make a version, send me a DM over on Instagram because I would love to see it. Yes, <laughs> that is actually really good. It's comfy and it seems really solid as well. I really like the finish from the Rubio white cotton on plywood. It looks awesome. Well, that's about it for this project. I hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe if you haven't and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Hi, John. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, the chair chipped out yesterday, so you should have it today. Cheers. Cool. So, yeah, I just wanted to ask you uh, about, about uh, the payment. Hello? John? That's weird. I don't know if you saw Peter McKinnon's axe, it was beautiful. Unfortunately, it sold out in seconds. Good for him. But lucky for me, I have this axe. It's not as cool, but it will do the trick. It's actually Swedish and it is hand forged. But what really got me interested was the wooden box that was seen on the photos from Peter McKinnon's axe. It was amazing. So today I'm making my own wooden box for my axe. 
and I only have this piece of pine that is 2.4 meters long so let's just start by cutting it up. So I started out by making a mistake, which was when I was cutting these pieces, I made them too narrow. So the plan is to make a box like this with a top and a bottom and then cut it in half and put on some hinges. The problem that I didn't account for is that when I'm cutting the box in half, I am losing about three millimeters and I think this would have been too snug. So I went back and cut new pieces and I think I had barely enough of wood for this problem so I can't make any more mistakes. Alright, so I have all my pieces cut and I'm going to do some lock rabbit joints on the side pieces and I'm going to do that with the table saw, so I'm going to start with that. And to do this I'm going to place one of my pieces right next to the fence and make sure it's aligned with the outer part of the blade. That way I know I have the right distance for cutting the first part of the rabbit joint and then I can cut the other part as well. I don't have a dado stack, so I'm just gonna have to do multiple passes with this. Alright, so I did a little change. I was planning on doing uh, the pine on both the top and the bottom, but it felt too too thick. So I went with plywood, it's 6 mil plywood in the bottom instead. And as you saw, I glued it together and then I had it cut flush with a flush trim bit on the router table. The next step is cutting this open on the table saw. I usually put some small pieces in the gap from the first cut. That way when I push it all the way through on all the sides it won't uh, collapse on the last cut. Ok, 
Okay, so I have one thing left to do before I stain the wood and that is to make an inlay inside of the box that matches the axe. So I've drawn a shape around the axe on this piece that was supposed to be the bottom from the beginning. And I'm just going to cut that out on the bandsaw and then I can place it inside of here and it will match the axe perfectly. And then I'll just stain everything and uh, put on some hinges and call it done. Alright, so I did the lid where I did this small groove and I also did the, the insert into the box. So the next step is adding some stain and I've tried different kinds of stain but I haven't found one to my liking so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these which are mixes that I've made myself from different kinds of stain because I wanted to have variations in the stain. But first, I'm going to bash it up with the axe and some other tools just to make it look old. I recently got this portable pizza oven, but I don't have a pizza peel for it, so today I'm going to make two. Because when I was reading up on it, a lot of people recommended a wooden pizza peel to get the pizza inside of the oven and an aluminium one to get the pizza out of the oven. I'm going to start with the wooden one and to do that I need to mill down some birch.
right, so when the glue is drying, I can start working on the aluminium one. I have made a template in Illustrator, so I'll just tape that onto the aluminium to trace it out, and then I can cut it on the bandsaw. Okay, so I have my shape and I think it looks good. For the handle, I'll be using black Valkromat because I think that will contrast the aluminium in a cool way. I'm just gonna draw it freehand, so let's get started with that. Alright, so the glue is dried so I can start working on the shape and I'll just use the same template as I did for the aluminium one. And while I was gluing this up I used biscuits so I have some lines which I have to take into account when drawing this shape out so that I don't cut it so that the biscuits are showing when it's finished. Alright, so before I continue sanding, I'm going to use this little jig I have for the table saw and it lets me slide the pizza peel this way and I have a slight angle on the blade and that way I can get a slight angle on the bottom here of the pizza peel to slide off or on the pizza easier. So I'm a bit scared of this but hopefully it will be just fine.
Now let's try these out, shall we? All right, so I don't want that happening again. So for this project, I'm going to make a tray and I'm going to make it using walnut and brass for handles. So the idea is quite simple. I'm going to make a box using the walnut and I'm going to try to bend the brass around the box to create a handle. But first things first, I need to mill and resaw the walnut. Alright, so I've finally assembled this, I've glued it up and I'll leave it here for a day. But when that is drying, I'm going to try to make the handles and that involves bending this brass. And to do it, I drew up a simple template. So I'm going to cut that on the bandsaw so that I have something to warp it around. And then I think I can just clamp it and if I need it, I can just add some heat to the brass and it will stay in its place, I hope. So the tricky thing here will be getting the bend where it's supposed to be, so that it's not too long or too short. But I think I'll figure that out. So let's get bending some brass.
Now it's tea time.
turn it on and yeah it works and it I'm really pleased with this project as it it's very simple I did this in one day and the bicycle light looks really nice as a head for this dog lamp the initial idea was to actually use the bicycle light for some kind of robot head but when I saw these dog lamps I was I couldn't resist making one so it's really cool that you can adjust the, the legs and also the head and the bicycle light so it can have multiple uses actually. It can be used as a desk light or just decoration light or something else. Start by getting the table saw to 45 degrees. I'm not sure how big I'm going to make the box yet so I have to figure that out as well. Just gonna lower the blade now that I know it's 45 degrees. And yeah, let's get this thing started.
Okay, so I have my, am I in focus? No. Okay, so I have my mitered pieces finished. And before I do anything with that, I'm going to make a patterned plywood lid for this. And it's going to be inserted uh, somewhere in here. So before I cut the grooves for the I'm lid, I'm just gonna rip a couple of pieces uh, of plywood and then glue them together. Okay, so the glue has been drying overnight and I glued this uh, plywood in on the diagonal so that I'll be able to cut it on the table saw on the diagonal to get diagonal pieces that I can glue up once again and then I can make the top plywood pattern. Um, I also made this push stick uh, with a 45 degree angle right here so that I can push the pieces through the table saw. Okay, so I have all the pieces I need and I'm going to start doing the glue up and normally I would do blue tape uh, and just fold it together, but I think it will be hard. Um, some of the pieces are kind of bent, so I don't know if I'll be able to force it with some clamps and glue. We'll see, but yeah, so let's do the glue up and then I can cut it apart again on the table saw. All right, so I think the glue is set. So I'm gonna take it apart and do some sanding, fill some gaps with some sawdust and glue, and then I'll cut it apart. All right, I've cleaned up the edges and it's time to cut the box open. And I'm going to cut the longer side first. And now before cutting the short sides, I added these small pieces.
So I have this brass rod as well and I've cut some small dowels from it and I'm going, going to add these dowels to the miters. All right, so I'm going to add some Danish oil to this, then I'll go inside and add some leather to the bottom and I'll consider it done. A while back I saw a box made by Claus Creations, uh, that's his name on Instagram, I think he has a YouTube channel as well, I'll link it down below.
the chessboard is finished and I am so proud. Uh, about two years ago I knew nothing about woodworking and uh, now I can accomplish this. So if anyone out there is planning on starting and thinking it's too late, it's never too late because even though this is not anything that is perfect, I, I managed to make a folding chessboard. Now this might be the weirdest project I've ever done. First of all, what the hell is this thing? Well, to give you a bit of history on this project, I started using snus 19 years ago. And snus is a Swedish type of tobacco that you put under your lip. And it is quite unfortunate that I've been doing it for 19 years as it is extremely hard to quit. For now, I want to build myself a safe that helps me take less of it. This is such a stupid idea. So what I need this safe to do is lock up my snooze and I buy it in sets of 10 of these boxes. And I don't want to use more than one box a day, so I only want to be able to open the safe every 24 hours. So to do this, I got some electronics. But before I get into the electronics, I should say there are many loopholes in this project. Like I could decide not to use more than just one box a day. And also the safe doesn't prevent me from going out and just buying more. And also when I open the safe, I could just take out more boxes than one. But that's not what this project is about. I want to build myself a safe where I am in control of my own limitations. You could say I'm trying to reduce my intake of snooze the fun way. Who knows, eventually I might be able to quit by reduction. Who am I kidding? So, the electronics. I've got an Arduino. Arduino is a microcontroller that is pretty simple to program even for people without any programming skills. That would be me. And the Arduino will be the brains of the operations. Next I have this keypad. If I enter the correct code, a green LED will light up and this little solenoid lock will unlock the safe. And if the code is incorrect, a red LED will light up. And to keep track of time, I have a small LCD that will show me how much time it is left before I can open the safe again. Now that's all the electronics, basically. Now for the programming, you can use Arduino's own software, it's pretty easy to use. And that's where I'm going to start because once I have my components ready, it'll be easier building the box around those. So, let's get programming. So I have a problem, or to be honest, I have a couple of problems. One, there's nothing showing on the display, which is a bit of an issue, of course. Secondly, I don't know what I'm doing here. You see, when doing Arduino, you need to use certain libraries of code specific to the hardware you're using. And in this case, I'm using a library for the display that isn't working currently. Another issue is that the countdown actually starts, but it ends straight away as well, so I have some figuring out to do. It might look like I did all the programming in one sitting, but that's not the case. I have been programming back and forth and I also got a lot of help from my brother. So shout out brother. But for now, enough talking, let's start building the box.
All right, so I think all the woodworking is done by now. I need a stop lock for the door so that it doesn't go into the box. Uh, and I'm also gonna attach the knob, but after that, I'm all done. So let's go ahead and start putting in the components to see if this thing actually works. Okay, so I've got it all hooked up now. This is the first time I'm trying it out, so I'm not sure if it's gonna work, but I really hope so. The programming was fine the last time I tried it at least. So let's try to open this up and see if I can actually use it. It does say enter passcode now, so I'll enter my passcode. <gasps> oh, yes. Yes. So I'm gonna try to enter the wrong password as well. Yeah, let's put the snooze in. And now, I can't open it anymore. Now there is one more major flaw with this and it's the on off switch on the back because if I turn it off, I can just turn it back on and I can enter the passcode again. To fix that, I think I need some kind of timekeeper with a battery inside the box that will just keep counting the time whenever the power is turned off. But that's gonna be a later problem. And as you can see, once closed, the box will stay closed for 24 hours before I can open it again. Now you might think you should actually store the snooze in the fridge and you are right, it should be stored in the fridge. But snooze lasts quite a long time outside of the fridge as well. So it's not really a problem for me the way I'm using it at least. Now that's it for this one. I do hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe if you haven't and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Oh. Arduino is a microcontroller. Arduino is a microcontroller. That's really hard to say. Arduino. Controller? Controller. Arduino is a microcontroller. And what is that? Now let's close you down. Do you ever look at your own stuff and only see the imperfections? Do you wonder if you'll ever be able to sell it because of those imperfections? And do those small imperfections prevent you from feeling content with what you've actually achieved? What if I tell you that you never have to feel like that again? There's actually a name for this thing and it's called the creator's curse. The creator's curse is pretty simple. Everyone is a victim of it. It's when you look at what you've done and only see the imperfections in it. And most of the time, those imperfections aren't visible to anyone else than yourself. It is very similar to the imposter syndrome, which is doubting your abilities and feeling like a fraud. And the most annoying thing about it is that it's universal. Every creator feels the same thing. So what can we do about it? Did you make this? This is awesome. Thanks, but there's a small dent in the wood right there and I don't think that's very good. Dude, if you hadn't said anything, I wouldn't have seen it. You have a, the creator's curse. The creator's what? 
the creator's curse everyone has it it's you you're gonna have it your entire life even if you improve your skills that sounds awful is there any cure for it though of course oh good i want to make a bench and to be able to get better at making the bench i want to make it repeatedly so if i enjoy the design i'll keep making it that is if anyone wants to buy it ever i'm not sure about that so for the design i went with something pretty simple the bench consists of the leg assembly, two stretchers and a seat. I started by milling up my material. For this project I am using some birch that I have had lying around for a while. I will need two longer pieces for the seat and the stretcher and a couple of shorter pieces for the legs. To make the legs I am first doing a template in 10mm MDF on the CNC. That way I can use the flush trim bit on the router to get four perfectly equal legs. Sometimes I wonder what it actually takes to be able to sell the stuff I make. Because even though I have made stuff in the past, I always tend to look at my own stuff with critical eyes. I see imperfections in everything I make. But I also see imperfections in what others make and sell. So I guess the limitation is with myself rather than with the product. But I've also realized that I rarely get to repeat projects and repeating something would probably lead me closer to perfection than anything else. But practice won't remove the imperfections, it will only reduce them. There are some upsides to imperfections as well. You could see the imperfections as part of the beauty. If it looks machine made, it usually lacks that soul that the imperfections give it. And we also have to remember that chances are that if you have a heartbeat, you're not perfect. So I guess what I'm saying is give yourself permission to make mistakes. Now there will be quite some pressure on the stretchers so I'm going to do a mortise and tenon for those. And for that I use my table saw and a tenoning jig with a flat tooth blade. For the mortise I'm using my CNC and then I can use a chisel to clean up the holes. Once I had all my pieces cut to size and sanded, I could start attaching them together. For the leg assembly, I kind of wish that I had a Festool domino for this, but I don't. I'm using dowels instead and that works just fine.
To create a roundover on the seat, I used a roundover bit with the router. The bit is exactly half the thickness of the seat, in this case 15 millimeters. That will make the roundover exactly round when run on both sides. I finished the piece with Rubio cotton white after sanding it down thoroughly. So before I show you the finished piece, let's figure out this thing about the creator's curse. If you ever look at your projects and only see the imperfections, know that everyone does. But also look at your achievement and be proud. You've actually made something that no matter what is your legacy. Suck it up and keep making. Everyone feels the same way. Also, take a step back or a couple of steps back and look at your project like something you would see from a distance in a store. And the last trick up my sleeve is actually keeping some of the feedback you've gotten in some kind of document that will help you remember what others told you. You can always go back and look at it and remember and that will boost your self-esteem. And now, let's have a look at the final piece. I'm about to steal some ideas from a friend of mine and then I'm gonna call him and ask him what he thinks about it. Hi Steve! You right? I didn't copy your project, I just stole your idea and made my own take on it. <laughs> it seems everyone steals my ideas, but yeah. But before I go ahead and steal, let's dive into the world of stealing. Because where do you actually draw the line between being inspired and stealing? And what is actually stealing? When researching, I found a lot of great makers talking about stealing. Like Steve Jobs, he said, good artists copy, great artists steal. We've always been shameless about stealing great ideas. And David Bowie said, the only art I'll ever study is stuff that I can steal from. And my favorite from Banksy stealing a quote from Picasso. So when do you actually cross the line into a simple thief of ideas? Growing up, my parents told me that stealing is immoral, something that is wrong. And I bet most of you were told the same thing. And now here I am telling you to steal. There's a book called Steal Like an Artist. It's a book by Austin Kleon and he lists some of the differences between good theft and bad theft. So good theft, according to Austin, is among other things stealing from many instead of just stealing from one. Because if you steal from one person, that is called plagiarism. But if you steal from many, people can't tell you did. You will just look like a creative who came up with your own thing. So think of your idols or your inspiration and gather them up in one place. Like do a mood board or whatever. Just collect all the things you want to steal into one place. So here's my plan of stealing. I have a friend of mine called Steve. He runs the YouTube channel Steve Bell Creates. And I also do a podcast together with him called The Three Northern Makers. And I will tell you, he is full of good ideas. So if you want to join me in stealing his ideas, listen back to the podcast. In his first ever YouTube video, he made wooden vases. And I really loved his idea of making wooden vases. So I'm just gonna steal it from him. I wonder what he will say about this. But I also found other things that I want to steal. So I collected all of the things I want to steal into one file. So rather than just stealing from Steve, I'm also stealing from bottle and bottle caps. I also have a furniture piece by Nick James Design because I really love the rounded shapes he makes on his items. 
So when I had all the things I needed, I just went to the computer and drew up my own design for a wooden vase. And this is what I came up with in Illustrator. And if you don't have Illustrator, any drawing program will do. So I have imported my files into Lightburn. That way I can use my laser to cut them out in three mil plywood, and then I can use it as a template. All right, so I have my two shapes. I don't really like the bottle one, so I'm just gonna go with this one. I have the router with a flush trim bit, but I am a bit scared of that machine. I've had some issues before with kickbacks and just ruining projects on it. So I'm a bit scared, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And everything went perfect until fun. So then I did it all over again, but this time I sanded it down to size with my spindle sander instead of using the flush trim bit. So if I drill down into the vase, I won't be able to put water in it. But my friend Steve, he came up with a really good idea. So what he did was that he dropped down test tubes into the drilled hole. That way he can pour water into the test tube without damaging the wood. And that way you can actually put living flowers inside. So naturally, according to the topic of this video, I'm gonna steal that idea too. So I have these test tubes that are 20 millimeters in diameter and I also have the same size Forstner bit. And since I wanna drill a bit further, I have an extension for the bit. To finish it, I'm using Rubio Monaco Pure. Not everyone is open to stealing their ideas. And that's why companies all over the world protect their ideas with patents. And one example being this. This is a plunge router from Bosch. They have a patent on the light that the router has whilst using it. Therefore, other companies can't do the same thing on their routers. And that is one more reason to use many sources of inspiration instead of just one. So when people around me say, where do you get all the ideas from? I can choose to say, I stole them, or I can say, I was inspired by. How are you? Yeah, good. So I made a video about stealing ideas, and I also told the viewers that you were a great source of stealing ideas from, since you have a lot of them. <laughs> it seems everyone steals my ideas, but yeah. Before I show it to you, uh, what are your thoughts about stealing ideas? Um. I don't, I think everyone steals ideas, Pierre. It's not necessarily uh, a blatant copy, although some people do just rip an idea off and copy it totally. Somebody I know made a bench that was very similar to a bench that you could <laughs> you could buy in a store. I won't mention the name. <laughs> but um, I think um, we all look for inspiration. So we get inspiration from things we... We search, let's just say we're going to build a vase. 
a wooden vase. You'll go searching for pictures of wooden vases, most people do, don't they? To try and get some inspiration about what big, how big it should be, what type of wood you should use, shapes. And so you get all that information and then you make your sort of version of it. So you have stone parts of lots of different ones to make something, and that's fine. But I think a blatant copy is a bit of a no-no. Yeah, but I I was really inspired of your wooden vase, but then I made like a map where I put some pictures of uh, of bottle caps and whiskey bottles, and then I tried tried uh, drawing uh, some shapes from that. the The bottle I drew, the whiskey bottle I drew, didn't turn out that good, but I made from a bottle cap from the Gorilla Glue, so that's that's the shape I went for. So I'm going to show it to you now. So this oh yeah oh that looks cool, huh? Yeah, is that a nice piece of form? And and this flower, this flower is actually one of the flowers you gave us when you came to visit. <laughs> <laughs> it looks fantastic. Steve was okay with my theft, and I think you should actually steal ideas. Just make sure they come from many sources instead of just one. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. What are you doing? I was just getting my tape measure. Okay. My workshop isn't just a workshop. I don't know about you, but to me it is a place of therapy. Something that is just mine. A place where I can enjoy myself. Not that way. But usually I'm just here to do work. But I would actually enjoy just being here with my thoughts sometimes. And my thoughts go really well together with whiskey, apparently. So today I've set myself a goal of making a whiskey cabinet for my workshop. And whenever I have time for a whiskey and some thinking, I can come out here, have myself a glass and just enjoy the therapeutic place that is my workshop. What I didn't know before starting was that it was going to get really hard to make this cabinet the way I wanted it. Let's just say some mistakes were made. The first thing I did was measure a bottle of whiskey, and they do come in different sizes and shapes depending on how much liquid they contain, so I decided I would go for one of the bigger ones that I like. I also decided that the cabinet should be able to hold two glasses. And if you wonder why I have the ugliest whiskey glasses, I'll get to that later. That was also a mistake. But that way I can come out here with a friend or a guest and offer them a whiskey. That's basically it. A cabinet with storage for two glasses and a bottle of whiskey. And a small drawer for something completely unnecessary. The workshop to me is becoming more and more of a sanctuary. I keep buying new tools that I can use to make new stuff and the tools themselves aren't necessarily adding any value to me, but that the workshop is growing and getting better definitely does something for me. I just love being here. But I relate being here to making things, so whenever I'm here I feel the need to do something. And I want this to be even more than just tools. Man cave feels like an overused word. So this is what I'm imagining. I can come out here one evening when the kids are asleep, I pour myself a small whiskey, I might listen to music as well, and I just wander about and do some cleaning or I just sit here and plan future projects. Or just sit here and think about life. Anyway, planning the cabinet out left me with this drawing, 400 by 270 millimeters and 150 millimeters wide. I want it to be accessible and somewhat dust protected, so not an open cabinet. If you want to download the drawing, I'll have a link in the description of the video. The first step of the build was to mill my material. I'm using ash for this. I started by cutting up the pieces I would need to the rough size with the miter saw. Then I went ahead and planed them down with the planer thicknesser. You see that trolls? I'm using the push blocks and not my hands. And then I faked checking for 90 degrees for camera. With this build I decided to give myself time to do everything slow and steady, so after milling everything I took a short break to clean up the mess I had already made. 
I guess this is a step of me trying to make the workshop time less stressful, because normally I don't have a lot of time to make a project and record it at the same time. When I had two faces planed, I could cut it on the table saw to the final width before using the thicknesser. And here's my second troll mistake. Using gloves with a table saw. I know I shouldn't, but to be honest, I just forgot. And the reason I'm wearing the gloves is that it was minus 10 degrees Celsius. That's 15 degrees Fahrenheit. I have one of those combined planar thicknessers, so I need to convert. And it usually takes some time, but I think this machine has been serving me really good. It's the craft machine from Axe Minister. Oh, and this is not sponsored. The only thing is that it takes a bit of time switching between the two. And you have to crank the wheel to lift the table up for the thicknesser because it's in the way of the big yellow dust extraction port. For the box itself, I'm going for mitered corners. To get those cut accurately, I'm using my contractor table saw. I spend as much time as possible to get the angle of the blade correct, and then I use a crosscut sled to cut the pieces. I make sure I have an accurate 45 degree miter, and then I can go ahead and cut the rest. This process is usually one of the hardest, because even though the measurement is correct, every now and then I don't end up with perfect miters. So not only is it good to set it up correctly, it is also very important to run the pieces through the blade so that the teeth of the blade have time to do the cutting. If I push too hard, it will flex the blade every now and then, and I will end up with a cup in the miter. My table saw crosscut sled has seen some action and it looks awful, but it still works just fine. I'm not one of those woodworkers who makes fancy jigs. I'd rather spend the time I have making stuff, than just making stuff for the workshop. Laying out my pieces and marking them is just to know what is up and front of the cabinet. I make sure the grain add up even though it won't matter because I'm kind of painting it. After all my mitered edges are cut, I can go ahead and start working on the pieces that will go inside the cabinet as shelves and the wall to separate the glasses from the bottle. You can use the table saw for this as well, but I don't want the dados going all the way through, and that's why I'm using the router instead. Because the bit of the router is round, I need to chisel out the rest when the cuts are done. And I should probably sharpen my chisels. That's one thing you can do whilst having a whiskey, right? Nah, no sharp tools while drinking. Once all my dados were cut correctly according to my drawing, it was time to glue up the cabinet. In order to glue up the miters, I'm using my new investment, the Festool Domino. This was the first time I used it on miters, but it worked perfectly. Then I could go ahead and add glue and just clamp everything up. Make sure it was perfectly square and then go on to make the shelf and the divider. The back of the cabinet will also have a small rebate where I can attach the backing board. And I forgot about that, so I was halfway through gluing up my cabinet when I realized that. So I had to take it all apart, remove the glue and then cut the rebate. For that I just used a table saw and a flat tooth blade. I attached a piece of wood to the fence to be able to get really close to the fence with the rebate. I've set the width to equal half the thickness of the cabinet walls, so 8mm. And then I just pass them through until all the material is removed. And I have myself a rebate on the back. Then I was ready to glue up the box once again. And when you're making things like this for the first time, it is really easy not to have all the steps in mind and mistakes happen. It wasn't a very bad one since I didn't damage the wood. And when the cabinet was in glue, I could mill more material for the shelf and the divider that will go inside the already cut dados. Look at the shoes I'm wearing. Cold. Feet. And minus 10 degrees. Ugly though. The shoes.
And since they go together, they also need dados cut, so I did that the same way as before with the router and a piece of scrap as a guide. I made sure they would fit in place and then I cut them to width on the table saw before I glued them in place. I did spend a lot of time thinking about the front and what I came up with in the end was this idea of a door that looks like a bottle of whiskey is trying to penetrate its way out. But what I didn't know then is that even though it sounds like a cool plan, it isn't that easy actually making it. To achieve that look I thought long and hard before I came up with an idea. I drew up a simple bottle in Fusion 360. Then in another software called Blender I used that same bottle to catch a falling cloth. It's pretty dope. And I thought I had come up with the perfect idea, but no matter how I tried to get it to look good, it didn't. In the software you can change all sorts of things to make the fabric fall differently, but nothing looked like I wanted it to look, so I just decided to give up. But then I realized that I was going about it way too complicated. Then I placed it onto a small piece of wood, made the edges come together, and there I had it. It wasn't as cool as the creases from the fabric landing on top of the bottle, but it was close. And it wouldn't take ages making it either. When I was pleased with the look, I exported that as an STL file, which is normally used for 3D printers, but this time I could use the 3D function in Easel. It's a software from Inventables that I use together with my CNC. I glued a small piece of wood on top of my door and then I could have the CNC cut away the bulk of the material to reveal the bottle. The carve is done in two steps. The first step removes most of the material and leaves a pretty rough surface, whilst the second step uses what is called a ball nose bit. The ball nose bit is rounded at the top and leaves a much smoother surface. After just two hours, I had a result. That's awesome! I wanted to make a small drawer to go in the bottom of the cabinet. I had all these pieces cut on the table saw and then I just smashed it together with glue and a plywood bottom. As easy as possible. Unfortunately, because I can be an idiot, I ruined the front when I was making a small handle to open it, so I accidentally drilled the hole on the bottom where I had a rebate for the drawer bottom. So I went with walnut instead because I had that milled to the correct size. After cutting all the pieces, I could go ahead and assemble the little drawer with glue. For hinges, I wanted to go with these hidden hinges called saws. They are really cool as they are hidden. The only issue is that they are a bit harder to install. So I gave up on the ones I ordered. Because I was closing in on finishing this project and I lose patience the closer to done I get with the project. I'm not sure if you're the same, but it happens to me all the time. So I went with the basic hinges instead. I chiseled out some pockets for them to sit in used a self-centering drill bit to pre-drill the holes and then attach the screws. Basic as possible. I added some magnets to hold the door as well since I wanted to stay closed and the hinges I chose won't keep it closed. This build might seem unnecessary, but the reward I get from making something like this is immense. I mean, something like this will last a really long time, and even if I move and change the place I live to something else, I can always bring my whiskey cabinet and put it up in a new workshop, and that new workshop will feel like mine. The front needed some sanding, and since it's so irregular, I had to do it all by hand. It took me quite some time, but in the end I was really pleased with how it looked. For the finish I used Rubio Monocoat. First a layer of 
pre-color easy intense black and then a layer of charcoal oil and I do think it was a good choice the cabinet looks so good in that color you might wonder why I didn't leave the ash but I really want to try this finish out you still see the grain and I think it looks awesome and it fits my workshop then I could go ahead and attach the cabinet to the wall of the workshop add some whiskey and some whiskey glasses that I ordered by mistake they have a bullet half penetrating them. I thought that was just a way to show how strong the glasses were when I ordered them. But turns out that they actually have a bullet in them. Who cares, as long as I can use them to drink whiskey right. In the small drawer I added some whiskey stones and why not a tape measure. Whiskey stones are basically a replacement for ice. You put them somewhere cold, like my workshop in the winter time, and then you can use them as ice without watering the whiskey out. What are you doing? I uh, was just getting myself a whiskey. Okay. I'm on my way to a store to buy the cheapest tools I can find below $200 to see if I can use them for fine woodworking. So I'm at the store, uh, it's time to go in. I always feel really awkward recording in front of people, but here we go. Can I use the cheapest tools to actually make something nice and useful? $200 seemed like an amount everyone should be able to save up over time and I don't think you necessarily need to go all fancy from the start. Maybe you just want to dabble in woodworking every now and then. So I went to a store that is called Viltema in Sweden to see if I could find some really cheap tools. I went around and got what I thought I needed for a specific piece of furniture that I have no idea if I'll be able to build. And to avoid waste, I'll go ahead and give away all the tools to someone who needs them when the project is done. All right, so I'm back in the car. And according to the receipt, I spent uh, 1,945 Swedish crowns, which is $186. So quite a bit below my budget. The project I had imagined was a stool that I've made in the past, but the one I made previously was made using the CNC. So by some that wouldn't even be considered woodworking. I guess the same people don't use a calculator for maths or even an oven for cooking. But this time around I only used the tools I had just purchased. And that would prove quite hard. Let's just say there's a reason they are so cheap. So the project is a stool I've designed in Fusion 360 which is a CAD software and since I had the plans on the computer I could go ahead and print the drawing I had on multiple A4 papers that I just taped together. Then I glued the template on top of a piece of 6mm plywood I had. This would of course be an extra cost, but you could also glue the paper directly on top of your wood. The legs of the stool consist of 4 pieces in total, but 2 pairs of equal legs. So I only needed 2 templates to cut the 4 leg pieces. I'll be using ash that I bought previously really cheap, and that isn't included in the price, but I bought a lot of ash for $100. The wood I'm using for this project is just a small part of it. The wood has been pre-milled because a jointer or a thicknesser wouldn't fit the budget, but you can buy pre-milled wood as well. The first tool I got to use was the jigsaw. This one was $28. It's a 550 watt jigsaw with an RPM of up to 2800. It has a lock bottom for continuous cutting, a grade scale. It came with three blades, one for wood, one for metal, and one for plastic. And inserting the blade was actually very easy on this machine. It doesn't look like much, and I have to say, it wasn't either. I started by cutting the plywood using the jigsaw, and it was quite slow. I figured I would get a lot of tear out around the cut in the plywood using the wooden blade, so instead I used the metal blade. I went slow and steady and once it was all cut I could use the next tool to sand any uneven surfaces left by the jigsaw. 
The sander was also $28, same as the jigsaw. It's a 125 watt sander with triangular shaped papers. It came with a dust collection adapter that I used later on. But sanding outdoors is a good way of escaping the worst of the dust if you don't have a shop vac. Just sending it over to the neighbor. The sander might have been one of the worst tools of the bunch. I sanded some of the rough parts quickly and for that it worked just fine. It would be worse later on when I had to sand the final project. I placed my template on the ash, traced it and then I was back to the jigsaw. I was afraid it might not cut a straight line as that was my main concern with using the jigsaw, but it actually wasn't bad at all. It was just slow. And that might have been due to the blade. Then I could attach my templates to the ash with some double-sided tape. Look at him using a fancy knife as well. Definitely out of budget. Well, I think most people have a knife, right? Yeah, but maybe not that fancy one. Well, but like I've said, you want it, but you don't need it. But you can use a scissor as well. When my templates were done, I was ready to start using the router. The main tool for this build, I would say and also the most expensive tool I got. It was $60, it's a 1200 watt plunge router. It came with the most common things a router comes with, a variable speed adjustment, a rotating end stop, template guide, circle stop block to cut round objects, and a parallel stop block and tension chucks for six and eight millimeters. It even came with extra chucks, so I guess they don't trust the quality of the chucks themselves. And here's another thing that wasn't included in the price, router bits. Already blowing the budget of this build. But a router bit isn't really a tool, more of an accessory. But then again, you wouldn't be able to use the router without any bits, so I'm not sure. Let's just say it didn't fit the budget. The bit collection I have is from Bosch and it was 50 bucks. Attaching the bit on this router wasn't easy. The dust collection is kind of in the way and you can of course remove it for easier access, but it is attached with two screws and I didn't feel like removing those just to insert the bit. For copying the template, I'm using a flush trim bit. It has a ball bearing that will reference the template and cut the rest of the material. The bit was about one millimeter off to be able to cut all the way through, so I had to do two passes. And the router worked kind of good, but it was really hard balancing it. Maybe I should have used the other pieces of wood as a support so that the router wouldn't pivot when I was routing. That balance issue caused some inaccuracies after I was done, but not more than it couldn't be sanded away at a later point. Other than that, it was actually quite good and I managed to cut the leg pieces quite quickly using the router. The next step was to glue the leg pairs together and to do that I wanted to use dowels. It might add some strength to the glue joint but also line the pieces up. And to do that I needed to use the next tool which is this drill and the drill bits I bought. The drill was also $28 and included a battery and a charger. It's a slow charging 12 volt battery that takes between 3 to 5 hours to charge so I really hoped it would last the entire build. But on the upside there are charge light indicators on the battery. And the force of the drill is weak. I taped the drill bit at 2 cm so that I knew I would be able to fit the 4 cm long dowels I bought. I measured where I wanted my dowels to go and drilled the holes with an 8mm bit since the dowels were 8mm. I tried to make sure I was going straight down and not drilling at an angle since that would really screw up the next step. To do that I needed to make some glue blocks since there aren't square corners to use with the clamps I got. So I drew and kind of measured the shape by eye to use the offcuts to create some glue blocks. And then it was back to the jigsaw to cut them out. Cutting these small parts with a jigsaw isn't ideal, but they also didn't need to be perfect, so it worked. I wrapped the blocks in blue tape and I also added blue tape to the legs, and then I super glued the blocks onto the legs to create a place for the clamps to go. So far, everything was working just fine. I went inside to do the glue up, and yeah, the glue wasn't included in the price either, so it was around $10, I suppose. 
I added glue to the dowels and the edges of the wood and tried clamping it with one of the clamps I bought, but the blue tape wouldn't hold. So I removed the tape and super glued the pieces I'd cut with the jigsaw directly to the legs instead. And then I could clamp them together nicely. Let's add the super glue and tape to the cast as well. I had the legs glue overnight and I started working on the seat. I already had a couple of pieces glued up for the seat, so I guess that's cheating as well. But nonetheless, that's the reality. To cut the round seat, I was going for the router again. This time with another bit and the circle stop lock that came with the machine. I measured out the center of the seat and half the total circumference of the seat from the bit to the center point. And then I started cutting lowering the bit ever so slightly with every new lap until I was all the way through. I had the cord hung to the ceiling along with the dust collector hose. So let's add the dust collector to the price as well. A really cheap shop vac would be around $15 more for the cheapest one that they have where I bought the rest of the tools. I had one slip up when cutting the circle where the guide jumped out of the position. It didn't really do any harm other than a small indentation in the seat. Then I sanded for ages with the sander, which was one of the tools I wasn't that impressed with. It felt like nothing was happening when sanding. To attach the legs to the bottom of the seat, I decided to router out a small pocket to give it some extra strength, and not just gluing it together. I traced the legs onto the seat and then routed freehand. And I realized I didn't really see anything, so I had to remove the dust collection guard. It looked fairly good, and then I added two dowels, and I was ready to glue it up. But here's where I lost patience. I couldn't come up with a good way to clamp it, whilst also controlling that the legs was level to the top. Look how I cheated. So I broke all the rules and used some bigger clamps. I'm sorry. And since I was already out of budget, I gave it a coat of Rubio Monocoat Intense Black and Charcoal Hard Wax Oil, which I added gold powder into. It gives a subtle glimmer to the finished piece, and I just love how it looks. And to anyone who doesn't enjoy the stain, you can hate me for staining, but as much as you'll try, you'll never hate me more than I hate myself. The ash also had some water stains that I weren't able to sand off, and I know there are ways of getting rid of it, but staining it was a lot easier and I really liked the look. As soon as I knew I was done using the tools, I posted a question on Facebook Marketplace asking if anyone wanted the tools for free. And it wasn't a hard sell. I immediately had someone come over to pick them up and he seemed pleased with them. And I have to say, I'm quite pleased and to be honest, proud because I only started woodworking three years ago and now I know how to do this piece from the drawing board to a finished piece. Also using the cheapest tools I could find. So I guess the big question is should you buy the cheapest tools you can find? Yes and no. I mean if you don't know that this is something you'll be doing for a long time going forward there's really no need to spend tons of money. And we've all done it, I suppose. We buy what we can afford at the moment to be able to get started, and then we get better tools when we can afford it and know that we want it. With that said, do some research according to your budget and what you think you'll be using it for. These tools, they do work, but I wouldn't recommend them for fine woodworking. Alright, thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one.